Hey, this is Zach Log the Great, and I am here tonight with my friend Nate. Hi, Emperor Thrangian the Fourth. And uh, we are uh, jo- also joined by Lewis, the illustrious Barrel King. Pleasure to meet your acquaintance. <laughs> And uh, we are uh, getting together tonight to talk about Richard Wilbur's poem, uh, A Christmas Hymn, uh, which Lewis has volunteered to read for us. Uh, before uh, One other thing before we get to that quickly. Um, if you uh, like my show, you like what I do, you want to support me, um, you can, uh, can do so through uh, subscribestar.com slash zacklug hyphen the hyphen great. And the link is going to be in the show description. Um, having uh, said that, I will uh, put the poem up on the screen. And, oh, wait. One moment. Uh, I will fix this minor error. Um, now I will put the poem up on the screen. And then we will, uh, and uh, Lewis will read it for us tonight. So you can let me know when that's visible. Roger that. Ready when you are, Kevin. Go ahead. All righty. A Christmas Hymn by Richard Wilbur. A stable lamp is lighted, whose glow shall wake the sky. The stars shall bend their voices, and every stone shall cry, and every stone shall cry, and straw like gold shall shine. A barn shall harbor heaven, a stall become a shrine this child through david's city shall ride in triumph by the palm shall strew its branches and every stone shall cry and every stone shall cry throw heavy dull and dumb and lie within the roadway to pave his kingdom come yet he shall be forsaken and yielded up to die the sky shall groan and darken and every stone shall cry And every stone shall cry. For stony hearts of men, God's blood upon the spearhead, God's love refused again. But now, as at the ending, the low is lifted high, the stars shall bend their voices, and every stone shall cry, and every stone shall cry in praises of the child by whose descent among us the worlds are reconciled. That's a beautiful poem, man. Okay, uh, so, Nate, since you were not our reader tonight, would you like to start us off? Yeah. <clears throat> this is uh, this is the kind of thing that people need to think about during Christmas. I mean, there is a, there's a place for merry and bright. And this has plenty of that, by the way, but there's also, there should be more space made for... Uh, contemplation of what's actually going on here and i think this really understands it and i really love how every stone shall cry even the lowest dumbest most insensate be they you know be they european or communist or both (laughs) will understand if one day that glory was here and so many of us rejected it and we you know we as humans all (laughs) together decided that the bearer of that glory would need to die. But first, the incarnation where perfection came down to inhabit an imperfect vessel and to deal with the imperfection of everyone else. Where the one being who can really say that I have, I am the law, I have upheld the law, is then killed by the very law that it embodies so that none of us have to be. Now I'm picturing ju- uh, Jesus as Judge Dredd. I am the law. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just that. Sorry, you were, you were being serious. Yeah. <laughs> I was being serious, but uh, <clears throat> I, I would rather have that one man say he's the law than the other, because the law of Jesus is at least justice, and there's a mercy in it. It's not just the law and death anymore. So death has been conquered. I, I will say, um, although I'm not... I wrote a poem about that one time, and I might have to share it with y'all. But um, 
I will say I haven't, although I haven't been, you know, great at observing it uh, this year, at least. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of like, you know, balancing, you know, merriment and, you know, contemplation, um, by the official calendar, at least, I think uh, Catholics uh, handle that pretty well. Um, as I said, not haven't, you know, been that observant this year, but like leading up to Christmas is actually supposed to be a time, it, the Advent is actually supposed to be a time of penitence, and the, um, and after is supposed to be, you know, feasting and rejoicing. And so it's, um, you know, I think they, they uh, why say they, I think we um, handle that, uh, that idea uh, pretty well, and that, that's a, that's a good approach to it. Um, as a Protestant, was... it's a little harder sometimes, but my church does a good job. And I think a lot of that's down to, you know, the leadership. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and Kenny, they do a good job with, uh, you know, teaching good things. And, I mean, it's not like, oh, no, God. <laughs> you know, there's there's plenty of, like I said, there's plenty of merriment. There's a lot of fun in it, you know, and even singing Christmas carols during the worship service, but you're singing the hymnal carols. You know, there's a lot of Christmas music that is good spiritual music. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, you know, I was like actually, we do a, a decent job at our church. as well. I think it Even was I, last, I think it was last year. I was, at, I was like in the grocery store, I remember. And I was actually just a little shocked when I heard an actual Christmas song that talks about like, you know, Jesus and Bethlehem on the radio in the grocery store. Um, uh, Black Pill, uh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with, um, and I don't know if he's still on YouTube, um, but uh, there's this one guy I followed, uh, Black Pill, who does, um, you know, mo- uh, he does a lot of uh, media analysis, like uh, movies and things like that. And he has, he has an interesting video about, um, about uh, what, what I call generic winter holiday music. Um <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, I could cold. I could listen. It's, it's, they're all getting together. It's nice presents and drinking. Yeah. I, I could of... listen. I could listen to Christmas music for days on end, but I I very quickly run out on generic winter holiday music. Um, but I think the um, best winter holiday piece I've heard in a long time is uh, August Burns Red Sledden Hill. For one thing, it's uh, they do their own thing with it. But it is like very much merry and bright. But even then, they uh, they get a guy on a fiddle and he lapses into a, a few bars of old time religion, and it's it's the leavening that makes the song great. You're like, yeah, all right, nice. Really fun. I gotta really give this a listen. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. To and to use the uh, our usual phrase to get back to the poem. Um, <laughs> if you ever make T-shirts, that's the first one. Ah, oh, yes, please. Merchandise. Uh, Zach, Zach Log merch. But uh, um, yeah, that has to be the first shirt. It needs to be in like nine colors. What was you get back oh, to the poem? Mm-hmm. I, one thing. I, one thing I do like about this as a um, Christmas poem is that it. It um you know it you know it does start with Christmas and it does actually end you know with Christmas who, by whose descent among us, but it also you know has you know in in a very brief outline you know the whole story. Well, uh, oh you're not, right, it, you're right. It well, does. It okay. goes throughout the entire thing. Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think it actually has the resurrection. Um. But, you know, but now it, the ending, the low is lifted high. Yeah, you're right. It's not really the resurrection, but you know that's coming. So it's sort of like a whole implied event that doesn't really show up. But because, like I said, the, the wonderful yeah, thing about the beginning of this story is that we know the end. Yeah, I don't hold that against this poem. I was just I was just correcting myself because I'm like, it's the whole story. And then I'm like, well... There's one pretty important thing that isn't here. Um, I'm not. I'm not blaming him uh, by any means on that. Um, but uh, the repetition of every stone shall cry in every stanza. It's a great. 
it's a great uh, anchor point for all of it, and it really, really brings home that whole idea of this world has been fallen for so long, and that now that this hope has come to us, now that the, you know the great God has taken form among us, that the world itself recognizes this, that there has been a fundamental change in creation. Because the creator has managed, you know, has has brought himself low enough to fit inside of it. There's actually another um there's actually another poem that another Christmas poem by C. S. Lewis um that I wanted to do um in, in this year instead of this one, but then when I started working on it, um started memorizing it, I found it was uh a little a little longer i didn't have basically i didn't have the time to memorize it um i had started it and well there's two things it was on the long side and also i started working on it and it was not sticking at all but um the c.s lewis poem um is uh the turn of the tide um and that one's kind of cool a kind of cool take on christmas because basically it like you know zoom it zooms out from bethlehem out to you know kind of the entire earth and then out from earth to the rest of the solar system and like there are the there are this he talks about like you know the salamanders in on the sun that have tails the size of the americas and like um and you know mars and jupiter watching you know watching from their thrones um and it's kind of it's kind of half the planets and half the, you know, Greek gods. Um, and there's just this shock that goes through all of creation at that moment. Um, and, and yeah, it's like, you know, kind of like what you were saying, Nate, um, this, there's this recognition, um, in this poem and every stone shall cry that, you know, the whole world is changing at this moment. So it's kind of, uh, kind of the same thing. If I, I, I'm gonna see if I can, you know, get that poem uh, ready for next year, because, like I've said uh, before, I, um, I, you know, memorize the poems I perform on here. I memorize, and that one was was not happening. Um, but maybe if I, maybe I, if I uh, spend some time with it between now and then, I can get it ready for next year. Anyway, um, another thing I like about this poem, I, I have, I can keep talking about things i like about this poem for some time oh, keep, so. keep going this is inspiring but also it's a bit of a plug for myself is that uh not this past year but year before i wrote and uh i put up a thing called i wish you a somber christmas and it talks about you know in a less uh in a less beautified way this very same thing that you know what we're talking about here all of our joy is because the sacrifice is born. That this child has come among us whose destiny is to be tortured to death because we suck. And so, you know, I thought that was a pretty decent video. Uh, you know, pretty decent little uh, essay slash lecture. You know, because, as I've said before, Mary and Bright is great, but let's think about this for a minute. You know, there's, re there's majesty, there's sacrifice. And so, you know, I love things that get the balance right, and this just so much does. I've said it before, I said it again, I'll probably say it again before we're done. Fantastic. Um, Excellent. so, oh, uh, Lewis, I don't think you've, uh, you, I don't think we've given you much mic time yet. Uh, oh, so oh, all's good. I've been uh, listening to uh, inspiring thoughts from the both of y'all, so it's uh, it's all good. I was just thinking how, uh our creator, the one who has uh, caused in 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 objects before the the uh, the Sea of Galilee, he commanded it calm down. And so that kind of underscores uh, the the goodness to which the earth was intended and was created, even though it did fall. And uh, I I really like how both of you guys have pointed out, and I completely agree. People need to be reminded of the uh, darker tones 
of the sacrifice involved, as Nate put it, that uh, there, nowadays there's a lot of people think of there's Black Friday, there's gift giving, there's a lot of all the secular stuff going on, feasting, drinking, and be merry. And I think it is extremely important, and I'm glad y'all brought this up, that somber reflection needs to be taken and we can't get lost in the tradition of merriment and forget about the reason for the season. So it's I'm I'm relieved to hear you guys bring this up. And I just want to reinforce that it's a, a wonderful, wonderful callback to uh, the importance of why we celebrate. So one other um, interesting thing about this poem, um, which... Um, no, we haven't. So that that refrain and every stone shall cry. That's that line is in this eight times, I believe. Um, uh, one, two, three. yeah, it's a eight in here eight, eight times, times. times. Um, which actually comes from um, that line is actually uh, not exactly, but it's a reference to um, Luke chapter nineteen, which is um, more or less the. Um, do that um luke chapter 19 is uh more or less the um content of the uh second stanza you know a child th through david's city shall ride and triumph by the palm shall strew its branches and every stone shall cry um and you know one of the you know great ironies of jesus story um yeah you know near you know very shortly before the time of his crucifixion, I think it's roughly a week, um, he enters the city of Jerusalem and he's riding a donkey, which, if I understand it correctly, that is what a, you know, a, um, you know, or a prince or a king coming, come, who comes to a city in peace. He would ride a donkey and that would be, and that would say, you know, I'm coming in peace. Yeah. Um and uh, you know he rides he rides a donkey into the city, and he is you know cheered by everybody, and you know he is welcomed, and you know they say, oh, the Pharisees yeah. and the Sadducees they wanted to show. Well, Hosanna. the the Hosanna. crowd the crowd Hosanna. the crowd says, "Blessed is he who come the king who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, Hosanna Hosanna in the highest." Um, and then the Pharisees uh, were you know said to said to Jesus. You know, hey, hey, don't let them say this. And uh, Jesus replied to them, if they I keep quiet. I tell you that if, if they, they should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Excellent. And so, um, and so, you know, the the uh, constant refrain of this poem is, um, you know, the stones you know, Jesus, from Jesus saying these stones themselves will cry out. Um, yeah. These stones will cry out if man, if, uh, you know, people, if man is silent in praise of me. Um, if, if I, you know, if they are quiet, if I tell them to be silent, even the stones will cry out. And so. Um, and coming from a guy who could literally order the sea into silence, I think that was literal. If the, all if all of a sudden he wanted the rocks and stones themselves to join in the chorus, I think they'd listen, and that would be an intense and amazing display right there. It happened at the hour of Jesus' death. There was a massive earthquake, and if you think that wasn't the stones crying out at the injustice of it all, I don't know. Ooh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Ooh. But uh, I love I love that the whole thing hinges around that and every stone shall cry, honestly, because you think about it, the human heart at this point in time has been likened to a stone in scripture many times. They said that the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit is to take the heart of stone from us and to put in us again a heart of flesh. And so every stone shall cry and every heart that is also a stone has cried. And even those that don't, that just truly, truly hate the idea of christ and all his teaching they still feel that cry in their stone hearts but there has to be something better that i i need to be a part of something i need to do something i need to i need to find a place to direct this longing and they 
always send it to the wrong places because they refuse to see the truth. But their heart knows. There's a um, powerful thing. So to, so, um, you know, si <coughs> since I uh, gave the reference for the other part, uh, I may as well for that too. Um, that is, uh, by the way, Ezekiel 36, 26. Um, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove, remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So, um, if anyone, if anyone is the in the audience is you know, keeping track of various scripture references tonight, um, that's where that one's from. And good on you. <laughs> um, I was I was able to find that so quickly because I uh, some uh, a friend of mine uh, at a church I used to go to had uh, turned that into a uh, had turned that uh, that section into part of a song, and I uh, I remembered it was from Ezekiel, and so I was, uh, and so. I knew I knew roughly where to where to look. So. so here's a question, just a complete something I, I kinda wonder about and wish had maybe gone this way. Judas, right? Ooh. The stoniest stone turd ever. <laughs> if he had been able to to hold himself back. And had not killed himself. I wonder if he would have got his his Peter moment. Something tells if me Jesus, I've actually I've actually uh, contemplated this like myself. You, Judas. You know, it's like you you betrayed me. You gave me up to my enemies, but ultimately it was the purpose I was here to serve, and somebody had to. You know, I would have liked to have known how Jesus would have treated Judas. I. It would have been probably the single most beautiful forgiveness there ever was. I'm willing to bet if Judas had thrown himself at the feet of Jesus, begging for his forgiveness, Jesus would not have turned him away. Um, I mean, you think about that actually Jesus, reminds me. Christ, you know, he he appeared to others who were against the church. Although, to be fair, for to be fair to uh, you know Saul of Tarsus, there he was. He genuinely thought he was doing God's will against a dangerous sect of heretics. But uh, when God appeared to him, you know, even though he had got done murdering some of his personal friends, you know, Jesus was still like, hey, um, no, serve me. Don't fight me. Well, like I said, just that. that... So, so to to do my uh, second C.S. Lewis reference of the night, that actually reminds me a little bit of uh, something from uh, Prince Caspian. Uh, the second of the Narnia books in the publishing order, which is the correct order to read them, by the way. Um, anyway, um, but uh, to, kn uh, to know what would have happened, child, said Aslan, no. Nobody has ever told that. But anyone can find out what will happen. Um, Interesting. And, well, and it's... um. And it's also the kind of um, interesting thing, you know, people talk about um, predestination and, you know, if God can see ahead of time what happens, you know, did we do we really have a choice? And, you know, yes. and, and, and then it's, you know, God doesn't. It's a kind of weird thing because like he know, I don't know. That's the trick. It's a very confusing thing. Yeah. God, God, sees time, God sees time like we see painting. That's an excellent way to he, put it, and I love that. He can, he can see the end. He can see the end and the beginning at the same time because he's outside of it. God doesn't move alongside us in time. Okay, time is a created thing. We experience time in our mortality. God, being immortal and you know so completely beyond it, no, he he sees the whole thing from beginning to end. You know, we experience this whole existence in the you know the the working of creation as cogs in a machine you know we, we we're the brush strokes so we we feel it all as it happens god sees the entire deal he's like yep that's how it goes <laughs> so an another thing actually in uh you know kind of in the you know the uh biblical uh marvel what if what if series um but uh which um 
By the way, for anyone who's who is you know very much caught up in today's culture, What If was a comic book series before it was a TV show. Just so you know, um, I've read a few of them. Uh, anyway, but um, what one thing I've wondered sometimes is like, did it have to be Judas, or were or like could it have been like any of the other any of the other you know twelve you know, who turned him over, like, it, and it would have been, and the thing is, like, if you look at it that way, and it's like, is there, like, each of them, well, I mean, all of us are human, all of us have a weak, have weak points, um, and, like, you know, for instance, it was very obvious that, you know, Peter, you know, had a weak point, because all it took was a couple of people, uh, a couple of nobody saying to him, hey, uh, didn't you know that um, Jesus guy? He's like, oh, no, I have no idea who you're talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, but, like, you know, so, for instance, if, uh, what is, there were, um, you know, two of his, uh, I forget which they were, two of his, two of the disciples, um, you know, used to be zealots, used to be basically uh, you know, political radicals, uh, you know, possibly even with the violent variety before you know, they fall. followed him. What'd you say, Nick? <clears throat> and they, they, they fall under the actual dictionary definition of terrorists. They use violence for political ends. Yeah. And, and, you it's know, actually and, kindness to call them zealots. And so two of them, you know, so two of the disciples were that. And like, so like if, if for that cause, would, would they have, could they have been in you know Judas's position? Because um, it's it's one of those things that I think is very easy for us to you know look at someone who fails and say, "Wow, you know what a horrible person you are." But like, I think it's also you can also say, "Look at you know if X, X, and Y had gone differently, you know." What if I was, you know, it would be, it would have been very easy for me to be in that position instead. And that's a, uh, I, I think that that uh, is important to think about. Agreed. And as, another thing to think about is technically we are Judas every time we sin because G the reason Jesus was born and to was needed to be sacrificed in the first place is because of our failings. So in a way, tech in a way, we all contribute to Judas, but we all come unlike Judas, we do not succumb to despair. We return to our creator. We uh repent of our uh wrongdoings and we try to make good, which is there's, um, imp very important. There's actually that that reminds me a little bit of a, a song. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give away a little bit about how old I am, even though I, uh, apparently don't look it. Um, but, uh, from the Supertones, um, they have had a song, uh, you know, part of which was my sins, my sins, yell crucify louder than the mob that day. Um, and, you know, why, you know, why it was. Why was he put up on that cross? Well, I'm not all of the reason, but I am part of it. And, yeah. That is true, and it is a sobering thought. But also remember, he had, what, 12 total disciples? One of them betrayed, and the other 11 took off and ran? And one of them... The, the one who was supposed to lead all of them, Peter, straight up denied that he even knew him. And yet, they all returned back to Jesus in fear, sure. But he forgave them, all of them. And that's an excellent kind of uh, uh, representation of what we should do as well. We should return. And y yes, there's going to be some... Uh, forgiveness that's going to need to happen, but we should not fear repentance. That's right. Two that actually um, reminds <laughs> me. Right. your sin, so not going to God because you've sinned is like not going to the shower because you smell bad. <laughs> you, 
you know, it's it's the thing you need to do to, to deal with the situation. And the other thing is the first half of Psalms 139. You know, you have searched me, you know me, you're familiar with all of my ways. You know, you knew me, you know, you formed my, uh, when I was in the deepest parts of the earth, you formed me. You know, all of that stuff. And it talks about how God knows who and what you are. He knows you on a level of intimacy that you can't even get with yourself. And if he knows all of that about us, he still chose to love us. So apparently, even though even though we know all this bad stuff about us, God apparently knows something better. And so, all right, I will I will trust the God that believes in me rather than, you know, the idiot human that keeps telling me bad things about myself. Amen. So and to to go back to um, what what Lewis was saying a minute ago, that that reminds me a little bit of something. Uh, I don't know. I've heard from I think at least two different sources, and I don't know which of them originated it. But um, you know, however bad things look, uh, you know, for Christians and you know, all of these you know forces are arrayed against us. It's like, and, you know, and, you know, church attendance is declining and all this. It's like, look, all we started with was 11 frightened men and one childless widow. I think we're going to make it. Jesus went out, dove into the barrel, hit the bottom, pulled off some splinters and grabbed the stuff from under the bottom of the barrel. And I was like, you guys. (laughs) You are what we, you are what we're gonna build the kingdom of heaven. That is so perfect. You're right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if he can use a bunch of ignorant fishermen, terrorists, tax collectors, and whatever else, I figure he can do okay with a goofy looking redneck too. There is it. hope, even for IRS agents, <laughs> yeah. if they repent. Oh, IRS, NASA, yeah. FBI, all of you guys, come on down. <laughs> uh, I don't know from what I've heard about the CIA. I'm, I'm. Uh... Oh, hey, if a Zacchaeus and the rest of them can get uh, forgiveness from Jesus, and they did some pretty, pretty janky things, uh, there's there's hope for the rest of us, including the CIA. So. It's just, it's just a question of repentance. Yeah, but they're, um, their agency, but yeah, it's probably the best. <laughs> um, well, and also, you know, on the question of you know repentance, I actually remember um, to to go back to 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 go back to the a how old I am and you know b uh, semi obscure uh, you know Christian music. Oh, yeah. uh, from my youth. Um, there actually was a band. I don't know if I heard the song, but I was aware of its existence. Um, and they have a song, um, you know, again, on the subject of repentance, which was Jeffrey Dahmer went to heaven. Um, oh. What? <laughs> he he had a, you know, jailhouse. Uh, he had a jailhouse conversion. Um, oh, God, God. God knows his heart. I don't. Um, you know, God judges, God is going to judge him, you know, not me. Um, but it's entirely possible. And Amen. if so, um, it will be that is a great it miracle. Strange, come. It'll be strangely interesting to meet him someday. Um, yeah. but look, if God can forgive a man like that, and if salvation is for such as him, then it's for anybody. And so, well, and the- it is on the by, flip God, side of- by God's own nature that we can trust that no sin we can commit is actually, you know, untouchable. There's, well, there's one, there's one, but that's to do evil in the name of God, to say that, yeah, in doing this, I am, I am acting in the name of, you know, the God of heaven, and you're doing things that are specifically against him. That, that is carrying the name of God in vain. But, uh, that that's not forgivable, but everything yeah. else. And on, well, you on know, the flip side of comfort. and on, on the flip side of that, and why I um you know like the the idea of that song is, you know, if 
you know, in genuine repentance, you know, for instance, Jeffrey Dahmer is not, you know, recoverable in genuine repentance. And like I said, God knows his heart. I don't. Did he make it? Did he not? I don't know. But if in genuine repentance, someone like him isn't recoverable, then what if I'm also, you know, not recoverable? I've never done anything roughly comparable, but I have broken God's laws. And, you know, if you, you know, and if you read the Gospels, Jesus said, um, you know, to hate your brother, you know, to hate your brother in your heart. Well, that's actually a lot like murder. You haven't, you know, to even if even if you haven't gone through with it to, you know, carry that kind of hatred um, is uh, is, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of. You know, to, to uh, you know. Give me a second. To go to slightly the other end of the scale, you know, unlike, for instance, Hillary Clinton, I've never had anyone killed. Okay? But also, unlike Hillary Clinton, I've never been in a position of power where I could say to someone, hey, go kill that person, and someone does. Shoot that guy in the back of the head twice and make it look like a suicide. I've I, I've never I've never been in a position where that is a genuine temptation for me, so I don't know how I would deal with that. Um, would I would I you know restrain myself or would I surrender to? I mean, there are people I would like to not be walking around today, <laughs> um, and I think we've all got a few of those. Mm. Although most yeah. of my most of mine are not personal most of mine are you know more large scale kind of things but um still a temptation mm. but you know i'm not you know if i if i had that kind of ability what would i do i don't know i haven't been tempted yet um, and you know and it's not it's not what you actually do it is your will it is you know the the part of you that makes the decision that matters and so, anyway. Well, allow uh, yourself to be a part of all of that, to allow those thoughts to be in you. The reason it's such a big deal. C.S. Lewis, for the, I think, fourth time now, <laughs> uh, he talks about in Mere Christianity, you know, why do we make such a big deal about it? And it's that the things we dwell on in our heart, we shape our hearts into the, you know, and we shape the kind of person that we are willing to be. And so if we think all of these hateful, vengeful, nasty thoughts, we think all these lustful, trashy thoughts, we think all this greed or all this laziness, <clears throat> we, you know, it's a little thumb mark in the clay of our soul. And we're shaping our souls every day, every decision, every thought, little press by press, little bit, 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 into something that's either heavenly or hellacious. And so, in the end, the things we actually do, given the ability, are really only the outgrowth of what we've shaped ourselves into. And so that's why we have to watch our thoughts and our desires, you know, so carefully, is that ultimately, they are the root of all action. There's a, um, I don't, I have the book, but I don't see it here right now. I don't know where that is. Anyway, but there's a in this one book I have, um, he talks about uh, some uh, principles from a mountain climber. Uh, he he said uh, that a uh, guy said some rules for mountain climbers. He, he said that are uh, he thinks very applicable to life in general. And one of them is never look somewhere you don't want to go. Um, and you know. Yeah. Don't don't deliberately spend time thinking about something you don't don't uh, you don't want to do or don't you know a place you don't want to end up because you know actions follow thoughts you you never do something until after you've already thought about it and if you don't want if this is something you don't want to do or know you should not do best first step. Don't spend time thinking about it because that's how you end up doing it. <sighs> Words of wisdom, Zach Log. That's that's good. I like that. I honestly never considered that 
Because th- you're right, thoughts are the precursor to action. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I like it. I'm going to pass that along. There, I, There's some folks that I know could use that wisdom. Ooh. That was a good poem. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Same. It was. It sounded like it needed a, like a musical rhythm to go with it, because when uh, the rocks cry, it, it even had a refrain with the rocks crying out. Well, I mean, it does say, um, you know, the title is a Christmas hymn. Um, so I, I suspect if someone uh, create, I am not a musician myself. I don't have that uh, that quite that creative bent. But I suspect if someone were to, uh, you know, create a score to go with this, um, I don't think Richard Wilbur would particularly object. Um, I don't know if he's with, is he, is he still kicking? Uh, Let me see. That would be fun if he was, because we could, oh, if he was still kicking, maybe we could get him on the show. Uh, no, uh, 20, died, uh, 2017. Aww. Um, so with us. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to point out quick. Um, I, I suspect I will have to um, go back. I, I read I read parts of this uh, one a while ago, um, but it's been some time. I suspect I'm going to have to go back mining because this is now the second uh, Richard Wilbur poem um, I've used for this channel. Um, the other one, uh, which is... Uh, Wait, I think Lewis might have actually Junk by Richard Wilbur. Was Lewis on that one? Nope. I uh, I would have remembered that one, and sadly, it uh, does not ring any bells. Now I've got to find out who was because I'm I'm just this is kind of bothering me who who it was who was in that talk. Uh, well, Wilbur seems to have an excellent source of good quality poetry, so oh, I, I would um, not mind reading more of his stuff. Mm. That was okay. So that was with Chris and Elena um, covered that one with me. But yes, um, junk, uh, which is another Richard Wilbur poem, which I, I like very much. Um, uh, but uh, now, where? Uh, um, oh, but like to you know, once again to get back to the poem um, and praise. I, I also really like the ending, which kind of. The ending of this poem kind of covers the whole thing. Um, in praises of the child, by whose descent among us, the worlds are reconciled. Um, and it is, again, he, he, he takes in you know, so much of the gospel story um, because, you know, you know, Jesus coming, you know, Jesus coming among us, God being born as a baby, among us, uh, by whose descent among us, the worlds are reconciled and, you know, heaven and earth, um, are pulled back together again. You know, we are, you know, we are set right. Um, we are, we are put back in our right place, um, you know, by, you know, God's action here. And that's a, a, a beautiful part of the story. Uh, I mean, not, the, not that is the story. That is what the whole thing is about. Um, it's not. I to to return for a moment to you know something we talked about earlier. You know, generic winter holiday music. Um, you know, Christmas is not one thing I've found kind of annoying, especially now that I live somewhere that, as a rule, doesn't get snow. Like. Christmas is not about snow and sleigh bells and, you know, hot chocolate and cold weather, especially because that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, but, you know, the, the, you know, the God of all the universe, you know, coming, um, you know, uh, you know, coming and, you know, stepping into his creation, uh, you know, coming to us as a little child, that does happen everywhere that does matter everywhere um and uh it's uh another another reason you know generic winter holiday music is kind of annoying and stupid i suspect especially for people who grew up 
you know, in a warmer climate. Or even just the Southern Hemisphere, because winter for us in the Northern Hemisphere <laughs> is summer for them. So in Australia, they're celebrating Christmas around a Bobby. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, they walk around upside down all the time. So, you know, I mean, they're used to things not making sense. Um, yeah. Oh, crikey, my ground harness came loose. Well, see you in the sun, boys. <laughs> oh. uh, but you um, make, that's a good point, though, because the, the, the temperature has nothing to do with the the reason that for the celebration mm -hmm. but um mm. i don't know i feel like i've uh i've covered most of what i wanted to say about this one um lewis uh Yo. did you have anything else you wanted to uh you wanted to add here just that this was an excellent poem for an excellent time and even though it wasn't the most joyful of poems, that's good because that's something that we need to be reminded of, especially people who get lost in the uh, the secular tradition of it all. So good, so good on both you and the poet who wrote it. Nate, uh, any any uh, last thoughts for you on the, from this poem? I say the same thing I said at church. Um, is that one of my favorite songs from this time of year is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And it's a song of a people who were promised a Messiah, and then for centuries they watched for him. And then when he finally arrived, so many of them were like, nope, and just completely whiffed on it. They were looking for the fastball and never even swung the bat. They just blew right by him. And so, you know... We've had tough times recently. The whole world has been having a whole bunch of fun. And what I would say is the same thing I said. Messiah has come to us, and God's deliverance is available to us all. Don't miss him. Because we all of us have a chance, especially in this season when it's so pervasive, to become a part of that story and to join in, to join hands with Messiah, and to know that God is with us. And so many people miss it. But after that, the silence is all because they won't get their fingers out of their own ears. Do not be those people. Okay. So, um, thank you again, uh, both, for joining me. Um, God be with you. And slightly late, but that's okay. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, and Merry Christmas to everyone who is watching this. Um, I don't know. Happy, I was about New, to... Year. Happy well, New Year! Well, Happy New Year as well. I need to. I need to get this up. I need to get this up tomorrow so we can have the Happy New Year. Um, and uh, a child is born. All right. Amen, so. brother. Good night. Good night. Peace. Everyone.